Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I've been noticing that there are some people who are still adjusting to the time change from last week. If you remember, we had an 11 o'clock service last week. A little bit of a time change. And it's been said that we've gained an extra hour. But truth be told, we've just been given back that which has been taken from us. Right? So, <laughs> but the question remains, what have we done with that extra hour? So we got used to not having it, now we have it. Have we become more productive? Have we added anything? Maybe reading the Bible. <laughs> right? I don't know. But it made me think of a couple of things. A few questions came into my mind. So I'll share them with you now that I have a captive audience. Of course, you can't leave. But anyway, <laughs> here are the questions that come to mind. What if we had a whole extra day in the week? What if we had eight days a week? What would we do with it? I know what the Beatles would do. They love you. That was John's part. Somebody had to pick up Paul's. We would have had a really tight harmony there. Anyway, what, what would we do? An extra day, what would you do with it? Well, a lot of people don't know that this has been tried. But not just eight days a week, not just nine, but ten days a week. French Revolutionary Calendar. That's what this was. Had a little help doing the homework on this one. But 10 days a week. They said, well, we'll be more productive if we have 10 days in a working week. And that was one of the stated purposes. It'll increase productivity. The other stated purpose was to do away with Christianity. It was to secularize the calendar. So they did away with all the holidays and everything. Gone. Basically, totally dispensing with God. And this was a stated purpose. Christmas. Instead of celebrating Jesus, they celebrated Isaac Newton, I believe. You can fact check me there. It's okay. Unbelievable. Get rid of God. Get God off this calendar. So what happened? Well, <laughs> when you go against God, it doesn't go right. In fact, they found that they were less productive. It turned out that you need to take that day off to be more productive. So it eventually ended. I believe 10 or to 12 years this went on. I think Napoleon got rid of it. Right? But he's no hero anyway. <laughs> Not what I'm trying to say. They eventually got rid of it. They were unproductive. So they reluctantly realized that when you go against God, it's not going to work out. And so on God's calendar, we have a day off. God took a day off. That was the pattern. And so should we. So this is going to be our topic this morning, getting rest, being balanced beings. So we've been looking at the historical accounts in the Bible. We landed in Ezra, which is a historical book of the Bible. We see that prophets weave their way through the accounts. We looked at different people in different roles. Zerubbabel and Jeshua. So we saw the governor role, which represents the practical, and Jeshua, the spiritual, the priest. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to try to bring some balance to both sides of the coin here. So now what we're going to look at is Ezra and Nehemiah. Strangely, Ezra in the book of Ezra comes into the account, chapter 7, a little late. It's a little weird, so I'm going to overview it for you. But we'll look at them. They resemble, again, these two types of people, the priest and the governor, the spiritual and the practical. And so today what I want to do is look at both sides of the coin kind of at the same time, if that's possible. So here, they're given permission now. This is later, and I'll show you this from the text, to go back. Artaxerxes gives them permission to go back. They're sent, kind of like the second wave, two extra waves of these exiles returning from Babylon to Jerusalem. We'd seen that first spiritual, they're building the temple. Now, what you have to think, it can be confusing, they're rebuilding the city and its walls. And so that's the next 
task we have here. Again, the Bible, it's not in chronological order. So if you've been here for a while, you've seen these things, the charts that we make. I've been told I do it in the wrong direction. Is that the right direction? <laughs> so anyway, I need more books. But anyway, <clears throat> made these charts for you. And you can see we land in Ezra. And it's just like a verse, and then some other stuff happens. And what you got to do is look very carefully at the kings reigning in these periods, and you can put it together chronologically. You may notice, oh, look, there's Esther. We're going to do that next week. All right? So it's not all chronological. We're going to keep with the theme so I don't lose you here. We'll do Esther next week, but that's about-ish where it would be. We return to Ezra 4. Finish that out, and remember, we did five and six last week, so we're going to jump over that to get chronological Ezra 7 through 10. That's the rest of it. So there's the book of Ezra, and then we're going to do Nehemiah, the whole thing. So you're going to be here for about three hours, so hang tight. Don't worry, we'll feed you. If you need a snack, you can go upstairs. No, just kidding. Don't get nervous. So again, we'll save Esther for next week. So we see in this short snippet that there's some opposition during Xerxes' reign. And so in your Bibles, they'll sometimes have different names. It gets really, really confusing. So Xerxes' reign, and here we go, Ezra 4, 6, years later. So you can see there's like a time lapse here. When Xerxes began his reign, the enemies of Judah wrote a letter of accusation against the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, this is where Esther would go. We're dealing with King Xerxes. So we're going to skip that. 4, 7, even later, this is marking off the time here, probably after that, even later during the reign of King Artaxerxes, next king of Persia, the enemies of Judah, led by Bishlam, Mithradash, <laughs> Dath, and Tabil, sent a letter to Artaxerxes in the Aramaic language, and it was translated to the king. It's going to be one of those days. So here's what happens. They write to them and they say, look, the king should know that these Jews who came here to Babylon, they're troublemakers. They're no good. Basically, if you allow them to rebuild this city, it's going to be trouble. You're going to lose the city. They're not going to pay their tributes. They've been a rebellious people year after year, which is partially true. The Jewish people were doing that, right? So you got to stop this. So Artaxerxes, he gets the letter, sends one back. You know what? I checked the records for myself, and they are. Insurrection and rebellion are normal there. So essentially, he sends them to shut it down, shut down the building. So again, this keeps happening to them. So this is regarding, again, the city and its walls. We skip forward a little bit. Ezra 7, 1. Many years later, during the reign of King Artaxerxes of Persia, there was a man named Ezra. He was the son of Sarahiah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ahitub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Marioth, son of Zeraiah, son of Uzziah, son of Bukai, son of Abishua, son of Phinehas, son of Eleazar, and son of Aaron the high priest. <sighs> okay. Yeah, that's a lot. So what is it doing? It's tracing his lineage all the way back to Moses' brother Aaron. So he's legit, right? So he's from the tribe of Levi. He's a legitimate high priest. And so the Bible will often do this. They'll give lineages for people like that. This Ezra was a scribe who was well-versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given to the people of Israel. He came up to Jerusalem from Babylon, and the king gave him everything he asked for. Why? Because the gracious hand of the Lord his God was on him. This is why the change, you might ask. Some of the people of Israel, as well as some of the priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, and temple servants traveled up to Jerusalem with him in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes' reign. So this gets interesting because he gives them like a letter of permission, provisions. You see a list of tons of different provisions. And he also gives them kind of a commandment. He says to him, hey, Ezra, you're to use the wisdom your God has given you to appoint magistrates, judges uh, who know God's laws, right? So they can govern all the people right. Teach the law to anyone who doesn't know it. So this is the Persian king telling him to do that. Anyone who refuses to obey the law of your God and the law of the king will be punished immediately by death, banishment, confiscation of goods, or imprisonment. Really interesting. So you have these Persian kings now working for the Lord. So what I'm going to do here is encourage you to read Ezra on your own. I'm not going to read the whole thing, as we'll see they did, <laughs> read the whole thing to you this morning. Just encourage you, read it. I'm going to do an overview because what we're going to look for are themes. 
what's kind of nice, if you have the time, about reading a whole book of the Bible. I've said it before in the past. It's kind of like watching a movie all in one shot. That's the way you're supposed to do it. But we read the Bible in these little snippets, and we don't put together things very well or put things together very well. That's the way the sentence was put together better. Anyway, so we don't see themes often. And so what I'm going to show you today is a theme. We're going to see a couple of them, but you'll see something very interesting. So Ezra 8, you get the exiles that had returned, the journey back. There's an interesting thing in chapter 9, the problem of intermarriage, if you know the Bible really well. Uh, they're not supposed to intermarry with other people. Why? The stated reason is because if you marry these foreign brides who worship other gods, they're going to draw you into their worship, their system of worship. And that's what happens. So it's a bad thing. That's why it's not, you can't insert that where you can, but you shouldn't insert that in today's culture, in our culture today. Intermarriage is just fine. But for them, this time, these people, no bueno. It's not good. So it's interesting when you look at Ezra to see his reaction. He pulls his hair out, tears his cloak, tears at his beard, right? So and he sits for a while. He's like, wait a minute, All right? So the people confess, Ezra 10, Ezra again, fasts. You see him constantly taking time to be with the Lord, think this through. And another interesting thing, he commands divorce. Both sides of the coins. When you're reading the whole Bible, a lot of people like to hang on like maybe Malachi or something, like God hates divorce. Yeah, it's not the ideal, but you see that there are times for it in the Bible, and times when it's appropriate, times when it happens. Here, this is where it happens, or one of the places it happens. And then Ezra ends strangely with a list. I call it the tattletale list. It's a list of all the people who are guilty. Imagine that. Imagine if you guys, like we did that as a church, not knowing we were writing the Bible, right? <laughs> and then I made a list. Like I got up here and I'm like, Ed and Lonnie, and like all by their, all their names. They're bad, they're bad, and Heather, and this and that. It gets put in a book, and that book becomes like, the best-selling book of all time, you know? So it's kind of funny to think about. Like, these people are remembered etched in history as doing something wrong. So I just laugh. I call it the tattletale list. It ends. It ends there. Historically, though, Ezra and Nehemiah, they were set. So, of course, it ends awkwardly. You're supposed to keep reading into Nehemiah. And we're going to see why today, because you will see a theme here. So if we go there, it starts out with Nehemiah. He says this a little later, but I'll kind of rearrange it for you. He's the king's cupbearer. So he has a close proximity and audience with the king of Persia at this time. So that's the setup here. That's why we're thinking. So his brother, Hanani, comes in and he lets him know things are not going well in Jerusalem. Like the wall is getting destroyed. Stuff is all messed up. And so Nehemiah doesn't like this. He gets very upset about it. He loves his people. And so he prays that he'll have success. Praise the Lord, please grant me success when I talk to the king about this. So the king notices, probably knows him real well, that he's sad. So he's kind of pouting a little bit. And so Nehemiah 2.4, the king asked, well, how can I help you? Because he lets him know he's upset. With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, this is Nehemiah speaking, if it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked, How long will you be gone when you will return? After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. Now, if you're reading it, I'll point out some details, bless you. You just got to pay attention, though. So he's also given provisions and given supplies. But unlike Ezra, he has one additional thing. Well, these are different things, but it stands out to me. He takes on a military force with him. Ezra didn't do that, so pay attention. Now, when he gets there, he has haters. He has people who don't like him. We get introduced to Sanballat and Tobiah. So what he does, he knows his mission is to rebuild the wall, start helping to rebuild the city. So he goes out at night, and he inspects the wall. So like he waits about three days. He goes out at night, inspects the wall. So he's kind of doing it a little covertly. So... Then there's a list of people you'll see who start repairing different parts of the wall, the gates. But these enemies, there's another guy now, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, they speak contemptuously about them. They start making fun of them. 
So they use accusation, derision, subversion, all these different techniques. And so you're going to see this theme continue. So it'll weave in and out of his enemies. So what he does, Nehemiah is a very practical guy. So he has the workforce split in two. Some people work on the wall. The others are guards. And eventually what happens is you see that even the workers have a sword strapped to them, a bow, chain mail. So you get this view that they're all armored up and ready at any minute. Then they come up with a system for trumpets. So if you guys over there in trouble, blow the trumpets. We'll go that way. So very practical, very systematic while they're doing the work. That's how Nehemiah reads. Everything's very, very detailed in here. So they continue the building, and again, more mockery, more opposition, back and forth. We see that Nehemiah does a lot of good stuff, and it's written in his voice. So you kind of got to keep in mind, he's talking about himself, and he's defending the oppressed. Again, more opposition, but by the time we get to chapter 6, they finish the wall in record time. 52 days they complete this wall. So after the wall is finished, he then appoints his brother, Hananiah to be like the governor, and also Hananiah, he's the commander of the fortress. He says he fears God than most people, so they can be trusted. And we see a huge registration of the people. So it's like, almost like reading the genealogies, about 50,000 people there. Now Ezra arrives in Nehemiah. Now he's on the scene, Nehemiah 8.1. All the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square just inside the water gate. They asked Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. So on October 8th, Ezra the priest brought the book of the law before the assembly, which included the men and women and all the children old enough to understand. The rest went in the kids' area. He faced the square just inside the water gate from early morning until noon and read aloud to everyone who could understand. All the people listened closely to the book of the law. That's a long sermon. <laughs> Don't get any ideas, Pastor Gene. Okay, <laughs> but note something. The people heard the word of the Lord. We see this in the Old Testament all the way into the New Testament. It's like Paul, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians. Read this letter aloud to the church. So it is another area where I like to point that out. Hearing the word of the Lord is a good thing. It gets in there in different ways. So they react strangely at first. They bow down, they mourn. Why? Because they realize they're not doing it, right? They're not, they haven't been doing it. So at first they're like, no, they're grieved. But they say, no, it's time to celebrate. They're encouraged by the leadership. The leadership goes back and reads it further. And they realize <clears throat> they're supposed to be celebrating three mandatory pilgrimage festivals, right? So you probably know about the Passover, 50 days later or seven weeks later, Pentecost, the feast Pentecost, the Greek name, I mean 50 days. So there's a third, shelters. A lot of people don't know about this one. Basically, it's to remember how God protected the Israelites when they wandered around the wilderness. So they go out and they get like leafy branches and stuff and make these, you know, tents or huts. Even to this day, Jewish people will literally put a tent in their backyard and they'll stay out in the tent to celebrate this festival. During it, as we see, they read the law. They read the law of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. And so that's what's really being reinstated here. So, <laughs> Nehemiah 9.1, on October 31st, so just under a month later, the people assembled again. And this time they fasted and dressed in burlap and sprinkled dust on their heads. Those last two things just symbolize, you know, being sorrowful, mourning for what you've done wrong. Those of Israelite descent separated themselves from all foreigners as they confessed their own sins and, interestingly, the sins of their ancestors. They remained standing in place for three hours while the book of the law of the Lord their God was read aloud to them. Then, for three more hours, they confessed their sins and worshiped the Lord their God. I'm getting a lot of great ideas. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> about what we might want to do on Sundays. So, yeah. I wonder who, yeah, I don't know. So anyway, don't worry about it. We'll have you out here in about an hour. <laughs> then the people confess their sins, and they agreed to obey. They make a document. They ratify this document, like contract. This takes us through chapter 11, then the dedication of the wall. And in 13, we see reforms, various reforms. And what's really funny, there's kind of a funny scene in here. Nehemiah goes away. Right? So his brother is in charge. He goes away. But when he comes back, one of those enemies is given a room in the temple. <laughs> and it's kind of funny. This guy Eliashib gives Tobiah 
a room in the temple. And Nehemiah does not like it. Like he's a hater. So he takes his stuff and throws it out of the room. So it's kind of an interesting scene there. Kind of makes me chuckle. Then we see the same problem of intermarriage. Nehemiah is going to address it too, but pay attention. Nehemiah 13, 23. About the same time, I realized that some of the men of Judah had married women from Ashdod, Amnon, and Moab. Furthermore, half their children spoke the language of Ashdod or some other people and could not speak the language of Judah at all. Now, if you remember the story of Lot, a lot of you know the story of Lot, what his wife do? Back, pillar of salt, right? So you may remember what Lot's daughters do. That is the origin of the Moabites and the Ammonites. That's why they're not like. So this is especially bad. They're like disgusting people. So I confronted them and called down curses on them. Nehemiah is talking. I beat some of them and pulled out their hair. I'm getting more ideas here. I made them swear in the name of God that they would not let their children intermarry with the pagan people of the land. Wasn't this exactly what led King Solomon of Israel into sin, I demanded? There was no king from any nation who could compare to him. And God loved him and made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by his foreign wives. How could you even think of committing the sinful deed and acting unfaithfully toward God by marrying foreign women? What's the big deal? Well, what Nehemiah is doing is putting this all in perspective. So if you've been paying attention to the, the whole series, this is where it all went south. A lot of people don't realize this. The reason for the exile, it starts with Solomon. A lot of people don't know that, right? So, Because in our culture, well, we want to be like Solomon and have lots of money and be really successful. The Bible says the opposite about him. So all the way back in the law, Deuteronomy 17, there's a list of things that, and here's, it's a concession, if you guys want a king and you're going to reject God, well, here's a list of the things the king has to obey. He has to abide by these things. People forget. They forget Deuteronomy. They read, and they don't remember. So they get to Solomon, and they're like, yeah, there's 1 Kings 11, and it's about all the brides and stuff like that. But da -da -da. Also, the horses from Egypt, all the money. The king isn't supposed to be super wealthy. The king's not supposed to get a stable of horses, especially, specifically stated, from Egypt. Remember Egypt? <laughs> don't go back there. Right? But Solomon, his bride is Pharaoh's daughter. <laughs> and then he has 700 wives. Did I get that right? 700 wives and 300 concubines. What? <laughs> One wife's enough, right? So, you know, I won't get myself in any more trouble than I already did this week. So, <laughs> so 700 wives and foreign brides. He goes nuts. His palace is approximately twice the size of the temple, and he takes like twice as long to build it. So God tells him, your family is going to be cursed. The kingdom, except two technically, but one, are going to be taken from you, but not in your time because I loved your father David. So your son's going to get it. And then all the other, and that's what happens. Rehoboam, he doesn't do himself any favors, but that's the only reason Solomon's spared. Otherwise, he would have been done. And so people don't realize it. They're like, woo, Solomon. Look at what Nehemiah is saying. Not great. <laughs> he messed up. And that's what caused the whole downfall of the kingdom. It started right there. Why? He worshipped Solomon, foreign gods. They leave that out. This is the rest of the story. So, Ezra and Nehemiah, and you might have picked up on this, they represent both sides of the faith and works coin working together. It's interesting. Nehemiah... Like Zerubbabel before him, he seems to be more concerned with the practical, with doing things very practically. Ezra, like Joshua, is a spiritual leader. Note how Ezra has complete trust in the Lord. So we're going to look at some contrasts. Ezra, so during the journey, what happens? I'll give you a window in. And there by the Hava Canal, I gave orders for all of us to fast and humble ourselves before God. We prayed that he would give us a safe journey and protect us, our children, <laughs> our goods as we traveled, right? So everything is under his protection. For I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to accompany us and protect us. Think about it. I was ashamed to ask the king for military protection. 
God's going to do it, right? <clears throat> From our enemies along the way. After all, we had told the king, our God's hand of protection is on all who worship him. But his fierce anger rages against those who abandon him. He's ashamed to ask for that assistance. But Nehemiah 2.9, when I came to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, I delivered the king's letters to them. The king, I should add, had sent along army officers and horsemen to protect me. Who, ah, nothing about God's hand of protection being on him. So it's the opposite. Ezra, spiritual protection. Nehemiah, practical protection. Remember the swords they strap on. Intermarriage. Look at the different reactions. Ezra 9.3, when I heard this, I tore my cloak and my shirt. I pulled hair from my head and my beard, and I sat down, utterly shocked that all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel came and sat with me because this outrage, because this outrage committed by the return exiles. And I sat there utterly appalled until the time of the evening sacrifice. Nehemiah, 13.25. So I confronted them and called down curses on them. I beat some of them and pulled out their hair. I made them swear in the name of God that they would not let their children intermarry with the pagan people of the land. Opposite reactions. Interesting. It also seems that Nehemiah is concentrating on himself quite a bit. If you read the whole book of Nehemiah, you're going to notice something. And it gets a little comical because it's pretty repetitive, as you can see on the screen. We put it up there. He's always reminding God to remember him. <laughs> it happens over and over and over again, no less than like four times in the last chapter. Remember what I did for these people. Remember all my deeds. He's reminding God to remember him and accounting for it, right, knowing other people are going to read it. It's kind of funny. So again, we see two sides of the same coin along this application of like spiritual growth and physical growth, doing things, faith and works, both sides of the coin. But I want to point your attention to one thing. It's an event in the last chapter of Nehemiah. So there's another issue aside from this intermarriage thing that's in that context. The Sabbath. There are people coming and going, working, trading on the Sabbath. It's a bad deal. So this is interesting. If, like I have, you've read the whole thing, is what I want to draw into your attention. It's where it all comes together. Because here, you have the practical guarding the spiritual. It's really interesting. So let me explain. The Sabbath. You probably heard the word. If you're a Christian, you know what that is, right? The Sabbath day. Fourth of the Ten Commandments. The idea here, the idea here is it's not just a day off. Like if I had to just, someone doesn't understand Christianity or the Bible or anything, it's your day off. Right? That's the simple way of putting it, right? Day off. And in Christianity, traditionally it's been Sunday. Jews celebrated on Saturday, so it was the seventh day of the week. You're going through this cycle, just kind of like mimicking God. So, but our work week, we, we, we start on Monday, right? Not Sunday, and then we go through, yeah, go through, and then take Sunday off. So traditionally in the church, they kind of like moved it over. It's Sunday, the Lord's Day. We talked about this, so you can go to church, right? So they celebrated the resurrection at the beginning of the week. Every Sunday, then they did their work. But in a Jewish context, that's going to be Saturday. So they're going to take Saturdays off. The real idea here is that you trust in the Lord. You're putting your faith in him. You're remembering what he did. That's the idea. It's a part of a pattern. So seven days of creation, on the, or six days, and on the seventh day, God rests. And that's the stated thing here. As I do, did, you do. Okay, so you just were mimicking godly behavior. It's just a good system and pattern. Disclaimer. Christians believe two things. We're a non-denominational church. I'm going to leave it up to you to believe in a literal seven-day creation, six-day creation, or not. The yom is a period of time, right? That's up to you. Non-denom, we don't argue about that stuff. So if you believe in the literal, you're probably still a Christian. If you believe in the longer time, you're probably still a Christian. 
welcome to C3. It's okay. But here's the thing. If you argue about that all the time, maybe not. So <laughs> the Sabbath is both practical and spiritual. It's an issue of humility. It teaches us that we're not God. That he's, as Jesus said, always working. He's got it. Take the day off. We need to rest physically, and we need to spend time with God away from the busyness, all the noise, the work, the world. This is the idea. Now, here is the thing. I just want to explain in case you don't know, very quickly, because in Christianity, there's all these different movements that come about. This is actually a very old one, and now it's coming back in to popularity. It's like Hebrew roots or something like that, right? So the idea here is foolish and heresy that you have to return to the law of Moses, that we have to do all that stuff. First of all, it's like the first heresy in the church. Read Acts 15. you got to get circumcised, all that stuff. Jesus' brother James does away with it by the power of the Holy Spirit and the full counsel of the apostles there. So read that again. Anyway, you can't do it. So the Ten Commandments represent the outline. That's what that is. And if you're reading Exodus, that happens. Then the rest of the Torah there, there's like 603 other commands. That's the law of Moses, and it cannot be done. You need a temple. You need a priesthood. You have to be from the line of Aaron. But no one else can do the sacrifices. You have to have all of those. So we have to be killing a lot of animals. You cannot do any of it. Without the land, without the priesthood, without the temple, it cannot be done. It's impossible. Yet there are people out kind of like being Pharisees, being legalists, forcing Christians <laughs> into that. So anyway, just a disclaimer of that. So this is not what I'm talking about as we move forward. The Ten Commandments can be seen as an outline, right? So <clears throat> here's the thing, right? We get to the Sabbath, fourth command. Okay, so honor the day of the Sabbath, like keep a Sabbath. But what, wait, hold on. Well, you know, when does it happen? Okay, but what do we do? What is work? What are we allowed to do? What are we not allowed to do? So all these questions are going to come into play, right? So don't gather sticks or we'll stone you to death. Oh, okay, that's the punishment for not keeping the Sabbath. Don't even light a fire in your house. So all those other commands, they're just like details. Yeah, it's like impossible to keep a real Sabbath. And you get killed if you don't. So details. Murder. What is murder? What is manslaughter? So you get all these other commands. Literally, like if you're chopping wood, the axe handle flies off and kills somebody, that's manslaughter. So you're going to go to a city of refuge, and then the Bible details all the cities of refuge and what the details are there, the rules about that. So you get my drift. So the Ten Commandments are just the initial list. And then 603 commands are like the what-ifs or like more about that. That's a good way to think about it. So here's the thing. No, we're not under the law of Moses. But, but the Ten Commandments have been the basis for Christian morality since the very beginning of the faith. All of them. And so here's a question. What one of the other Ten Commandments is okay to break? It's an interesting way to think. I challenge you. So if we went into the kids' area, Right? And we went in there and we said, and you probably hear me like, what one of the Ten Commandments is okay to break? They'd be like, none of them, Pastor G. Right? So like, that's not good. Just like that. That's not good. So think about it. Should we have other gods? Should we make idols? No, no, no. Should we take the name of the Lord in vain? Some of y'all do that. But you shouldn't. You know you shouldn't. Skip the Sabbath. Everybody does. Should you honor your parents? Yeah. Right? Should you commit murder, adultery, steal, lie, or covet? No, 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 no. We know that. But the Sabbath, it's amazing. So I've found, as a pastor, the Sabbath is the one of the Ten Commandments, the only one that Christians are proud of breaking. They're proud to break it. Look how much I do. Think, what was the reason for the Sabbath again? Trusting God like Ezra did. But look how much I do. They do the, they flip it. Look at what I'm doing. I'm such a hard worker. I'm such a good person. <laughs> Interesting. This is an area where, if we're being very honest, and I'm going to be very honest with you, this is an area where our culture has contaminated our Christianity. 
this is. Because it's a mimicking of this culture, right? our work ethic, not godly culture. Godly culture is saying, not me. I'm just a vessel. Now, here's an interesting point I want to show you, and then you'll get more reasoning behind the Sabbath. What a lot of people don't know is that the Sabbath is actually commanded before the giving of the law. It's interesting. So, they, you remember the parting of the Red Sea, you probably got that down, right? Now they're wandering around the wilderness, and the Israelites are immediately complaining. <laughs> immediately. That water's too bitter, we're thirsty for the new water, right? And we want food. God provides, like the quail come, but there's the manna. What is it? That's what it means. What is it? Manna. So it's like this flaky substance comes in the dew with the dew in the morning, like that, right? on the ground. It looks like coriander seed, and it tastes like honeycomb or something. Good stuff. The idea here is that God provides you with your daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. God provides it. Right? So there's two things to happen here. God gives it spiritual, practical. You go get it. And so they gather up about two quarts every day because no more than that, if you gather more than that, it gets all rotten with maggots and stuff. Why? No. Trust that God's going to give you the manna the next day. So that's the deal. So every morning, morning by morning, new mercies I see. So boom, it comes out, comes out. Sixth day, gather twice as much. Why? Because you're not doing the practical on the seventh day. That's your Sabbath. So now you get twice as much, and it won't rot. Practical, spiritual. God wants us to work with him, but to trust him. So it'll stay good for two days. But here's the thing, Exodus 17, 27. Some of the people went out anyway on the seventh day, but they found no food. The Lord asked Moses, how long will these people refuse to obey my commands and instructions? They must realize that the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. Sabbath, it's God's gift to us. When we don't take a day of rest, we're rejecting God's gift. I got it. Along with the key to spiritual growth, stopping. Sometimes it means doing less. Let's go back and read again what Ezra did. So it's his journey. 821, we saw this. And there, by the Hava Canal, I gave orders for all of us to fast and humble ourselves before God. They're stopping. We prayed that God would give us a safe journey and protect us, our children, and our goods as we traveled. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to accompany us to protect us from enemies along the way. After all, we had told the king, our God's hand of protection is on all who worship him, but his fierce anger rages against those who abandon him. Take a look at the next verse. So we fasted and earnestly prayed that our God would take care of us. And he heard our prayer. They relied on God, and they stopped. And this is interesting, because a lot of people don't point this out. Through Jesus' ministry, at oftentimes, he stops. He stops. He prays. He fasts. No one talks about that stuff, especially the last one. He would go off. <laughs> you got that. He would go off to be alone, or he prayed. Luke 5.15 but despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster, and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. And we see that he instructs the disciples to do the same. For example, Mark 6, he's rejected in his own hometown. Then he sends the disciples out. Then Mark decides, hey, let me just recall during that time frame John the Baptist, what happened to him, beheaded. Right? Then the disciples come back. Story picks up. Mark 6.30, the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told them all that they had done and taught. And Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by a boat for a quiet place where they could be rested. Now, here's the thing. 
Jesus, when he's rebuking the Pharisees, he's not speaking out against the Sabbath. You have to remember this in timing and context. He is a Torah observant Jew. He never sinned. If he broke any of those laws, he wouldn't be the perfect sacrificial lamb. He didn't break any Sabbaths. He took a weekly Sabbath. He went to the festivals. We're going to continue seeing that. We've talked about this. Right? So these festivals, you can't work during certain times. It's like a whole week. So he took his vacations. Let's put it in that context, right? So he took his weekly day off and went on vacation. Mandatory, three times a year. But we're going to see, as we continue in the series, more than that. Now, a lot of time, right? taking time off. The idea here is that Jesus is rebuking the extra traditions. So a lot of people will hop to like Romans 14, Colossians 2. You read uh, John 5, 17, I think. <clears throat> you read these verses and it seems as if we shouldn't take a Sabbath, but you have to read it in context and we see that Paul and Jesus are actually saying the Sabbath is a good thing. They're defending the abuse of the Sabbath. This is these Pharisees piling in. It's already hard piling in these extra traditions, things you can and cannot do. He's healing people on the Sabbath. That's work. The disciples grab a head of grain in the field. That's work. You know, so it's cut it out. You know what I mean? They're being Pharisees, right? Look at me. Look how awesome I am. That's what's being rebuked here. The Sabbath is a good thing. What's being said here when we look at the whole thing, full counsel of God's word, is that when we refuse to take a Sabbath, we're saying, look at what I'm doing. Look at what I'm doing. When we take a Sabbath in humility unto the Lord, we're saying, look at what he's doing. Look at what he's doing. And we're trusting what he's going to do. Tell me, Lord. Ask him on that day. Look at what God is doing. So we can choose to follow God's path, his pattern, and trust and humility. Be like Jesus. He did it. Or the prideful plan of man. We must focus on the Lord, follow his plan, instead of the world's plan for us. The world is constantly trying to convince you that you need to get it for yourself. Everything. You're the hero. You're going to save yourself. You got it. You got it. And what does it do? <laughs> no. The Word says the opposite. The Word says God's got it. God's got it. Slow down a little. Yeah, you got to do your assignment. You have to do what the Lord told you to do. Six days a week. One for God. Just listen. We often try to make up for fear, insecurities, things like that. We fall prey to what the world tells us. We become imbalanced. And guess what? The enemy is happy to use all of it. He's going to use all of it. He uses this kind of thing, and we talked about this in the past, to divide us as a church to divide families, but also the enemy uses it to divide us from God. He wants us so busy, <laughs> we can't hear God. We couldn't recognize him. Remember that secular 10-day work week? How'd it work? No. Didn't work well. It's all about doing away with God. That's what that was about. That's what they're doing. The enemy wins. So we shouldn't turn our back on it. We should guard that relationship. That's where the other side of the coin came in. Think about it. Even though Nehemiah represents the practical, he observed and defended the Sabbath. So, right, so you got to think, we got to build this wall in record time. What do we say today? Like if I gave you a deadline, well, I guess we're not taking any days off. That's the first thing we come up with. That's our solution to it. Right? So any project, house project, some, you know, we have to get this finished before we go away on vacation, whatever it is. Okay, you have a deadline. Oh, that's it. No more days off. Or at work. You have this big project. I hear this all the time. Big project at work, so I can't come to church. I'm like, okay. You know what I mean? Like, no more days off. That's our solution. What was Nehemiah's solution? Well, we're going to take our days off and trust that God will get it done. 
52 days. He got it done. We need to find that kind of balance. We have to do our due diligence, whatever that is, and Nehemiah's doing it. But we have to honor God in that process. Healthy, healthy balance. I've learned that nobody is smarter than the Sabbath. Nobody. I've seen it take pastors out. Pastors refuse to take a day off. Take them out. Exhaustion. I, I've seen it ruin their marriages because they got a wife, maybe a kid at home. Spend time with me. Nope. Got to build a wall. <laughs> okay? I've seen it totally end ministry. Unbelievable. Either from physical, spiritual, emotional exhaustion. Regular people. I've seen it end their lives, their marriages. I've seen it ruin their spiritual life. They're not praying. They're not connected at all. They're not listening. It has consequences. People have fallen from the faith. Now, I've heard smart people say, well, if you have a job that's going to cost you your marriage, quit the job. Right? What about the job costing us a relationship with God, which is actually the more important relationship? You want to know a key to relationships? Honor God before that person. It makes for a much healthier relationship. Because then you're doing everything by his commands. My family, we all love Jesus more than each other. But that's the key to healthy relationships. What about our relationship with God? What if a job or something we're doing is going to cost us that? Jesus warns, where our treasure is, there our hearts will also be. So some encouragement. We need to find balance. So <clears throat> during especially this holiday season, know that it's okay to say no to certain things. You know, people ask me, how are how, how you doing, Pastor? And today, <laughs> I was honest. Tired, tired, because this is the time of year when all of a sudden, what? There's like all these insane social expectations. If you work in retail, I'm praying for you, right? So it's just insane. It's insane. All these man-made holidays, Hallmark, that, you know, Montgomery Ward, they made it up, but yet we fall right into it. <laughs> Slow down. Take time with God, like the reason for the season. So here's the thing. It's okay to say no. And no is a complete sentence. No. To certain things. You can say no to a job. You can say no to a client. You can say no to holiday parties. I will give you a permission slip. I'd be more than happy to do that for you. Don't have to go to every party or especially every fight you're invited to. It's okay to say no. It's okay to trust that the Lord will provide. That's the point. So this holiday season, be encouraged. Be thankful. Be sure that you're spending your time with the Lord before you engage in all of these other relationships because the key to all good relationships is God. I'm giving you that permission this season. Take the time to say, look at what the Lord is doing. Remember that the Sabbath is God's gift to you. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church, this time, these people. Be encouraged. I just encourage them to rest in you. Just take that time and set it aside as much as they possibly can so that they be, can be guided by your goodness. Make them vehicles of your grace, your mercy, your peace, and your love, especially during this busy time, this busy season. Encourage them. that You have given them the permission they need to slow down and spend time with you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you.